Good morning. Welcome back to Blockhash Exploring the Blockchain, episode 312 today. Uh, a special guest from Concordium, Core, the CTO, is going to join us and explain a bit more about what Concordium is and what they're working on. And we'll get to learn a bit more about him as well. Core, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing, man? Thank you for having me, uh, Brandon. It, it's great to be here. I'm great. Absolutely. Um, before we jump in and start talking a bit more about Concordium and kind of learning about you know the ecosystem that you guys are building, we'd love to learn a bit more about yourself. Can you tell us more about your past and your background and you know your history in in this wonderful world of Web three that we all love and how you got to Concordium? No, absolutely. Uh, I'm, so I'm currently the chief technology officer uh, at Concordium and. Uh, I'm actually also the uh, CPO uh, at Concordium. This means, first of all, my responsibility is to make sure that uh, the products we build are, are the right ones and then will enable anyone to build amazing application using our, our blockchain. Um, so I'm responsible both for the product direction, but also for the actual tech underneath. Prior to joining Concordium, <clears throat> I was running storage compute networking and site reliability teams at a company called Cloud Kitchens for almost two years. Cloud Kitchens is, um, is founded by Travis Kalanick, who, uh, as um, many would know, is the founder of Uber as well. And um, I was recruited there from Uber, actually, where I was heading storage teams from 2014 to 2020. When I joined Uber, there was around 400 people total in the company. And when I left, there was some 27,000. So that was, that was an amazing growth journey uh, with a lot of learnings in it. Prior to Uber, I had my own 35-people uh, company for 10 years. Uh, where I helped digitize the uh, Danish public sector. And Denmark is, is leading the 2022 digital government, um, ranking number one of the 193 United member, uh, Nation member states. So we score the highest when it comes to, to the scope and quality of online services. And I was in the middle of that for about a decade, which was extremely interesting. Prior to that, I lived in Silicon Valley, working for startups in the dot-com bubble days. And, um, and so that means I, I'm pretty old, actually, in, in, in the game. I hold a master's okay. degree in computer science from the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Awesome. So you've kind of been around quite a bit over the last decade or so in, in the tech space, huh? Even, even more, actually. More like the last 25 years, actually. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing anything from being an engineer for many years, building all kinds of software, to being a manager, to living in Denmark, living in the States, living in Canada. Even I was the uh, site lead for Uber's Toronto operations in 2019 um, as well. So, you know, doing a lot of different stuff. Uh, Web3 for me is is um, about a year in, um, but the whole thing about ledger technology and storage technologies is something I've been doing for more than a decade. So I, I know the tech underneath. That's really cool. So have you, you know, come across and been interested in blockchain and, and crypto and Web3, like just in the past year, like you mentioned, or was there a time earlier to that prior that, you know, maybe it piqued your interest or, you know, it came across and you're like, maybe this is an industry I want to work in. Yeah, actually the, uh, the, the angle I came at it from was more of like an infrastructure uh, angle, right? So I've been working in infrastructure for so long now. And, um, and at Uber, I was building these uh, horizontally scalable storage systems on, to on top of which we built a, a ledger style yeah. uh, application, which we use for all kinds of, of practical purposes. So I sort of came at it from that angle more than from sort of the crypto space. So I, you can see me as sort of an infrastructure guy who's come in and, and uh, have been sort of uh, bitten by, by the crypto portion as well. So, so, uh, so that was what I, what I picked up over the last year, but, but all of the infrastructure portion, how you build scalable storage, how you, uh, but distributed systems um, at massive scale is, is something I have a lot of experience with. Awesome. No, that, that's a really cool background to have. How, so how did you from that point come to be working with and working on Concordium? Was that also very recently? I know Concordium has had a very uh, recent history and is very young. So was it, you know, back around 2021 or was it much earlier than that? I actually joined a year ago uh, on March the 1st, so I'm almost a year into my, my role here. Um, and um, the way that happened was, as it often is, through the network. So I was, um, I was being contacted by the founder uh, of Concordium and, and the CEO. Uh, and they basically called me up and said, hey, uh, you know, um, 
we um, we need a, a CTO to to help us run uh, Concordium, and and you've been been recommended through the network. Are you interested in talking? And so we started talking, and uh, and uh, you know after after some back and forth, I decided this this is an opportunity that cannot be missed. So I decided to to pack it up, leave Cloud Kitchens, and uh, and join Concordium uh, to to start as the CTO there. Um, Concordium, and, and maybe this is a, a follow-up question for you, as you sort of mentioned a little bit. Concordium is is from 2017 originally. That's when the whole thing started. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was founded by uh, Lars Saya, who is um, who came from sort of a, a banking background. So he's he's a person who uh, who was early days in the in the internet and and one of the first to produce an online web two site where you could do online investments, and that became a big thing. So uh, Lars sold it off and. And then afterwards, he started looking for what's next. And he's always been super interested in in blockchain and um, felt that that's where the future is headed. Uh, but that there is also problems with with uh, with the current space, and that it's sort of not really catering to existing businesses all that much, right? There's the whole blockchain space has been riddled with scams and and rock pulls and all kinds of bad things. A lot of bad actors playing there as well, alongside a lot of good actors. But because of that. Um, blue chip um, companies might not be as interested in moving over. So he was looking around for for someone who had a solution to this. And from his experience, you know, there's this whole thing about um, banks that 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 um, are forced to do KYC on their customers, and that really involves doing an identity check. And so he realized that hey, maybe that's what we need in in the blockchain space. We need to keep the the privacy on the transactions, and people need to be able to do tra- you know private transactions and and, and keep their privacy. But if bad actors show up, we also need a way for, for for forensics to sort of kick in and to help law enforcement um, figure out what's been going on and, and prosecute uh, if necessary, right? So that's how he realized we need to build a new blockchain. And then he, he contacted the University of Aarhus, where you will find a lot of crypto experts, many of which have been there for many decades. And and actually some of them who even invented some of the core protocols in the, that, that are in blockchain today. Um, so he, he started collaborating with, um, with the, the, the computer science department in, um, in Aarhus and in ETH in Zurich and Zurich um, and kicked off what is known as COBRA, it's Concordium Blockchain Research Center, Aarhus. Uh, with that collaboration, we've been, been creating some 87 white papers and some 17 PhDs over the past, what is that, five, six years now. And we've then built Concordium on top of uh, that pile of papers, if you will, uh, which means that we are backed by science. So we, that's one of the things we claim we are backed by science. And when we say that, that's actually what we mean. We've actually worked together directly with these scientists to figure out, you know, how do you do a modern consensus protocol? How do you do fast finalization? How do you make your uh, blockchain stable in in your terms so that all transactions always cost the same, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, that's, really, that's really that, right? Um, and um, as part of this, we have built in an identity verification process, uh, and I'd like to expand on that. But that's you know that's the high level, right, uh, of what Concordium is. No, I love it. I I love the fact that you guys have this uh, methodical scientific method approach to blockchain. There's not a whole lot of other chains out there that do that. I think, um, and it's and it's good. I think in this industry, that is something that is very well needed and um, will pan out very well for Concordium. Uh, is so is the privacy and security aspect that you were mentioning, you know, around transactions, one of maybe the core fundamentals for um, what Concordium is hoping to, you know, pioneer, or are there other areas as well? So maybe give me a brief overview of some of the things that you guys are working on with Concordium. Right. So, <clears throat> so at a high level, uh, we are a proof of stake blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, we um, so we have everything that you would expect there, right? You can you can stake your uh, cryptocurrencies. We have a native cryptocurrency called the CCD. You can stake that in our miner nodes, and they're called Bakers on Concordium, to make an uh, you know an ROI uh, on and, and and get a return on your investment there. Um, the the blockchain, as I said, is um, has fast finalization. So so our consensus layer is is an Akimoto style consensus that we have sort of augmented with uh, our own fast finalization layer. And, and that's been sort of the, the premise. So at this time, uh, we can safely say that we run around 400 TPS um, 
um, on, on regular hardware. But of course, it's a thing that we're also looking to improve, right? So we're building out uh, our consensus mechanism as we speak, and we expect to see a two to three X uh, improvement on, on TPS because of that uh, coming into like the fall of 2023. Concordium's identity is really what's our secret sauce, though, because the ID is not sort of an afterthought that we've built on top of the blockchain. It's actually woven into the entire protocol of Concordium so that uh, whenever you, anyone who opens an account on Concordium, they have to go through an identity verification process before they can do that. And once you have done that, uh, that's a one-off, right? You can open all the accounts you want to. And you can do all the transactions you want to in a private um, in a private manner. And most of the times you remain private. But if law enforcement comes to us and says, hey, looks like something if he has been going on here, can you help us investigate? Concordium can point law enforcement to uh, what we call anonymity revokers. And these are law firms that have been equipped with, um, with special decryption keys. These decryption keys uh, don't do anything uh, individually, but when you bring them together, they form a super key that can unlock a transaction on the chain and reveal a pseudonym plus the name of the identity verifier that did the um, ver verification of the identity originally. With that in hand, law enforcement can now go to the identity verifier and say, who is behind the pseudonym? Uh, and the identity verifier can look it up in the database and say, oh, this is uh, a guy called Cor Kjellstrom. Um, here's his information, and then you know you can be prosecuted. So it's like a very manual process. The keys themselves are not on chain or anything; they are stored in in, um, in vaults uh, on physical ledger devices, and will only be brought out in in case there's a subpoena that actually um, you know uh, warrants this, right? And all of the crypto behind all of this was um, was um, uh, invented by by the scientists at the University of Oz in the crypto department there. So you know that that's really a, a uh, sort of the premise. Of course, this is a little bit of a negative spin if you think about it. And and um, and so, with the infrastructure we have, we uh, we've started furthering the more positive uh, aspect of it, which is that once you have an identity in your wallet, you can start using it to build interesting applications. With zero knowledge proofs, uh, we are able to allow applications to ask questions of the user's uh, uh, wallet. And, and basically use that uh, to decide whether or not to grant access to things or, or anything really. So you can imagine, for instance, a website, uh, you go past the website and, and you want to buy some, uh, something to drink, right? You put some sodas in your basket and then you put maybe a bottle of, of whiskey in your basket and now you want to check out. And most countries you'll have to ask for some age check. Some countries it's 18, other countries it's 21 maybe. Um, and in, in many instances on the internet today, you know, things like that, the age check is actually realized just by you clicking a button and just saying, yeah, I, I'm 18, move on, right? Uh, but that doesn't actually fly legally. So uh, if, if you went into a store in physical, in real life, you'd have to flash your ID card and, and basically show that you are older than, let's say, 18. With Concordium, an application can actually query the wallet uh, and the wallet will then pop up a, a box to the user and say, this application wants to know if you're older than 18. Do you want to return that information? And by the way, the answer is yes. If you click yes, a zero knowledge proof is generated, which is then returned to the application. The application can validate that the proof is valid, that the answer is um, older than 18, and, and that the underlying credential came from an identity that was verified by one of the identity verifiers that we have whitelisted on Concordium. So that gives you sort of a, a, a pile of trust that you can use in order to to interact with um, actors that have a Concordium wallet. And you can do that for anything, right? So it's not just like, you know, your, I mean, you can ask, are you older than 18? You can also ask, what is your birth date? You can ask, what is your name? What is your country? Or do you live in Europe? Or do you not live in, in North, North uh, Korea, for instance, right? So it's, it's all kind of direct attributes, but also indirect kind of um, attributes that can be, be used in these queries.
Yeah, that's fascinating. So like if I wanted to prove that I was 18 or a store needed to verify I was 18 and I walked in, let's let's say it's in the US because you have to be to buy, uh, or actually 21 to buy alcohol. So going to the US, a US store, I want to buy a bottle of alcohol. Um, I need to prove my identity. Would that be done through like a Concordium application on the user's phone or would it be through maybe the store or the provider, the POS service, um, maybe through some connection to the network there? How do you guys kind of envision that working in a economic sense? You know, Brandon, in, in the beginning, we'll be catering to uh, sort of the online use cases. Uh, Concordium mm -hmm. has four wallets. We have a desktop wallet. We have a browser plugin uh, that works for Chromium browsers. So Microsoft Edge, Chrome, um, Brave, all of these browsers. We have iOS and we have Android wallets. And with the latter three, uh, we will be able to, to do these identity applications or build these identity applications. To begin with, you can imagine, um, you know, typically websites, right? You go past a website and you want to, uh, to interact with that website. You can use your Concordium wallet as a means to log in, for instance, that's an option. And once, you, uh, once you're in, you can use the zero knowledge proof infrastructure to prove things about yourself. For instance, you're older than 21. You can also use the mobile phones for the same thing through a, a technology called Wallet Connect. So there you actually scan a QR code using your camera on your phone, and then you connect your Concordium wallet on your phone to the website uh, through a back channel. And through that, you can now start interacting and transacting, or you can even send, send our CCDs back and forth. And, and But you can also use your um, identity portion and, and do these things. But if we fast forward into the future, there's nothing that hinders us from integrating these uh, capabilities with phones NFC chip, for instance. And you could imagine giving zero knowledge proof through other means to other types of uh, application. So it doesn't actually have to be uh, only web, right? It could also be like physical sort of interactions. So yeah, that I mean, that's an interesting sort of direction it can take. Uh, initially, we'll be focusing on the sort of online cases, but in the future, mm -hmm. we might actually go down that path as well. Yeah, really cool. What about other than the individual, what about a corporate or enterprise type use case, maybe with their existing employees or customers in their database or uh, mm -hmm. B2B type interactions. I bet there's some use cases there. Oh, there's tons of them. And and um, so what I just explained is what we can do now, right? What we're mm -hmm. currently building is uh, we're building what we call Web3 ID, which is an extension of all of this where you we built on the uh, W3C specifications for verifiable credentials. So So that specification basically allows any company or person to become an issuer of a credential. And a credential here is sort of, um, the broadest in the broadest possible sense, it's it's me claiming something about someone else, or someone claiming something about someone else. So it could be a university, uh, you know, giving away a diploma for a student, or it could be a company uh, claiming that someone is an employee, or it could be uh, the department store giving a loyalty card away to to some person, or you know, um, frequent flyer card from from an airline, or or anything. And all of these verifiable credentials will then be um, be um, available inside the Concordium wallet. So you, you will be able to see all of your verifiable credentials, plus you will be able to, um, to use them in interactions with applications. So an application could say, hey, I need to know if you work for Concordium, because then I'll let you in or I'll give you 10% discount in my store or whatever it could be. Um, or in order to, to, to vote here in um, this municipality, you, we need to know that, uh, that you have a proof of address that you actually live here. And then you can prove that using your, your zero knowledge proof infrastructure and you can get access to vote about, you know, improvements to your local school or whatever it could be, right? It could actually be pretty much anything you can think of that, that sort of identifies you in the broadest possible sense as a person in all kinds of roles that can be held within the Concordium wallet going forward. And so... What we're currently doing is we, we are lowering the bar for becoming an issuer on Concordium, uh, integrating with all kinds of standards. Uh, we are building out the wallets so that they can hold these verifiable credentials so you can see them in your wallet. And we are building a, the, an infrastructure for those who want to check and craft questions for people and, and businesses uh, such that it's super easy to, to ask questions and verify uh, claims as they come back. Uh, so, so that that's really where this is headed. Awesome. What what are some of those wallets that are integrated with your ecosystem that maybe users are using today or that you're working on? So, um, 
So, so currently, the, the wallets that are on Concordium have been built by our team. Uh, we're mm -hmm. currently integrating with Frontier Wallet as well, and we have a couple of other wallets that, that are coming down the pipeline. Um, these are early days for the other ones, but, but Frontier Wallet is already building, and so we're expecting to see more and more wallets uh, adopting this. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to to leverage this identity infrastructure outside of Concordium relatively soon as well. One, one of the things we're looking to do is to to see how how we can easily make this integratable with anything that you have. So you can start claiming ownership of things that are outside of um, of the Concordium space. Right? Imagine if you think about your identity online, for instance, you um, you probably have a LinkedIn account, right? You might have an email address. Most people do. Um, but but oftentimes these things um, are sort of standalone, right? If I if I if I uh, if you go and find me on LinkedIn, you'll probably find me because I'm internet unique. But some other person might actually also create a Kjellstrom account online, and, and suddenly there might be two, right? And how do you know which one is the right one, for instance? What if I could prove to you that this particular one is actually mine? Um, and the same thing goes for email addresses and other things where people sometimes need to, to actually to actually reveal themselves to others, right? A lot of times you actually want to be anonymous, um, but you want to be verified. And, and that's also a use case we're looking at so that, that others can vouch and say, hey, but I actually use that infrastructure to verify that this person is actually who they say they are. For instance, on online chat forums where you trust the, the chat forum, right? Um, but that person might still want to remain anonymous, but verified. Right. Oftentimes, people have a pseudonym online, um, and but but still, the person operating the platform don't want any kind of random person to just go rogue in there. They want maybe identified people, um, and still allow for them to be anonymous online. Right. So that kind of use case is also one that we can support with this infrastructure. Yeah, I've had so many problems with that on social media. I think what you're talking about is something that'll become very valuable. There's been plenty of times where someone will like create a whole account with like my name and everything and what I do. And then they'll reach out to all my followers. And then some of them will um, message me, be like, is this you uh, soliciting all this stuff? I'm like, no, 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 that's not me. Don't listen to it. And then I'll go to report it. And then Instagram will tell me, no, this is a normal account. This is a legit account. This is you. And I'm like, no, it's not me. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, exactly. the systems I think that we have don't don't work, I think, when when trying to verify identity online. It's it's very difficult. So I get, I understand that too. So excited to see you know what kind of solutions you guys can put forward as well for things like that because it is a it's a huge issue today and yeah, we hope we'll be able to to publish some relatively soon about exactly this particular use case we have actually been building something around this for some time now and um and so i'll let you know brandon as soon as we have it ready and then hopefully we'll be able to to help you going forward with not being being scammed or being be exposed to to scammers absolutely or not having to pay eight dollars a month on twitter or Meta. <laughs> exactly, right? I mean, Meta came out with us at like $12 or something. I think they want to charge for, yeah. for that blue tick version. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately. I guess that's the way they're going with it, monetizing the whole, you know, feeling importance, I think, kind of experience where you should just be able to verify everyone's real. It's, it, it's kind of weird how it's, it's monetized in that way, isn't it? It doesn't scale, right? I mean, in, yeah. in the long run, you have all these social media sites and, and who's willing to pay like 10 bucks for each one of them. I don't think that's going to fly. Um, I doubt that that will work. Yeah, I guess we'll see what happens with it. Um, you guys also have a hackathon that's been going on here in February. Did you guys wrap that up already or is it still happening? It's actually still happening. This is this is our second hackathon this year. We, we kicked off the year with a small one. Um, for a uh, group called She Builds. Mm -hmm. But we had around 100 participants in that one. That was early January. And now uh, the one we have right now is with the Gitcoin. We kicked it off on, on February the 6th and um, we'll be, uh, we're expecting projects to be submitted by, uh, by the 26th. So we have another three days before the, the final projects come in. And we'll take three weeks to judge the projects and um, we'll just disperse the prices by um, March 17th. The theme of this hackathon is to build on the future of uh, identity. Uh, so we basically want to to create the next generation of use cases which use the Concordium's ID. And and the better the uh, application using the ID, the, the higher the chance of, of a win here. So um, the plan of course is for us to fuel our ecosystem, get more developers to, uh, to understand what it is to build on Concordium and why you can build awesome applications uh, on our platform. 
And so, um, so the bounties we, we actually have um, start actually at, at a very low level. We have like four tasks that you can complete. And we, by completing each one of the tasks, you'll actually get uh, a CCD grant. And then at the final price is if you build a real DApp using the Concordium ID, well, then you get um, potentially uh, an even bigger price. So the first task is simply just to set up your development environment. And for that task, um, out of the currently 280 participants that we have, which I'm actually part of, 99 people have completed the first task already. Um, the second one is to deploy smart contracts. So these are the small applications that you can you can write on the chain. Uh, we have 38 who completed that at this time. And then the first is um, the, the third one is your first uh, Concordium D app, where we have 12 people. Uh, and then finally, uh, building the future of ID is 10. Right? So at this time, we're looking at 10 submissions of um, of real applications on Concordium. So I'm really excited to see what that'll be. Maybe we'll see even more before the weekend is over. Um, I'm hopeful, but um, but for now, I'm actually quite uh, thrilled that, that we have that large participation. No, that's awesome to have that kind of level of participation. Are you guys expecting to see use cases that primarily bolster some of the things you guys are working on around identity? Or are you expecting or starting to see maybe some things that push the envelope of what you can do at Concordium? I'm hopeful for the latter, but I think maybe we'll just, uh, for now, I'm probably guessing we'll be seeing applications that leverage the, uh, what we could call the legal identifier, right? The, your, mm -hmm. um, what comes from your passport in some hopefully innovative uh, way that we haven't thought of. That's, that's really what I'm hoping here, yeah, that, that, that some ingenuity coming up. We have over 15,000 US dollars worth of prices up for grabs in this hackathon. And um, we're planning to have a third one that comes later in the year where we have even bigger prices. So, uh, you know, the audience keep an eye out for that. And um, going forward, we'll be doing the same thing. We, we want to basically make sure that that stuff is happening on Concordium and then we get the ID out there and, uh, and get awesome applications built. Awesome. Um, before we start wrapping up the episode, final question, what, and I know we talked about it a little bit throughout the episode, but what are some things that you're excited for here in 2023 with Concordium that maybe is coming um, soon or later in the year or things on the roadmap that maybe you want people to keep a close eye on as you develop them out? Uh, what stands out for you? Right. So, so I mentioned the Web3 ID, of course, which is, which is a big one, right? Being able to have all these verifiable credentials and build all these mm -hmm. awesome applications. So that's a big one. Of course, that also means our wallets will have to be updated and support all of this so that you can easily manage all of your verifiable credentials alongside your NFTs and, and your cryptocurrencies. Um, we will also be integrating with uh, the European identity infrastructure. So anyone holding a, an EID will have an easy time getting an identity. It just means basically a swipe on your phone and then you'll have a concordium id um, we're catering a lot to developers so we're building uh, sdks in multiple languages adding tons of examples tutorials both for smart contracts and, and decentralized applications this is something that's been lacking a little bit in the past but but now we are really focusing on on, um, on making it easy for uh, for developers um, we will be uh, improving on the core node itself I mentioned that we'll be scaling two to three X with the consensus protocol upgrade that we are rolling out. And we're planning to continue down the path of scalability. Uh, potentially next, the next thing we'll be building is probably going to be parallelized right inside the nodes themselves, which might also give us around a two to three X speed up. And then um, we're looking at what sharding uh, should look like for Concordium. There are multiple options. And, um, and that's a thing that will definitely happen. Um, so I think, that, that's sort of uh, some of the main stuff that, that's in the pipeline, right? We, uh, we continue to, to, to basically break up our chain into smaller pieces. So for instance, the, the wallets will become, be turned into to libraries where the underlying portion of connecting to the chain uh, can be something where you can use it as a white label. So imagine that you want to build an application that runs on your mobile phone. You want to take advantage of the Concordium infrastructure, but you really don't want to, to interact directly with the Concordium wallet through your app, right? You want it to make a more seamless experience. You want to cater to that particular use case as well and, and, and basically make it such that Concordium becomes an infrastructure component with an ecosystem around it that has all of this identity um, infrastructure available for you to build on, um, but make it your own, right? Awesome. No, it's really exciting what you guys are working on. It's going to be cool to see kind of roll out. 
uh, here over time. Where can people go to kind of keep up with everything? Where should they go? Is there a website, social media? Do you guys have a community you want to direct them to? Yes, um, of course, um, you can go to www.concordium.com. Uh, that is a good starting point, but there's also, uh, we have uh, Discord channels, we have Telegram channels, um, moderators in, in all of these spaces. If you're a developer, uh, we have a developer website, uh, developers.concordium.com, where you can find all of the information about how to um, to interact with us, information about what to, to get, where you can even download the source code from Git. Everything is open source. So, so yeah, you'll find all of the, uh, the things you're used to from the blockchain world in Concordium as well. And uh, we've, we are fully staffed on all channels and, and ready to, to answer all questions you might have. What about you? If someone wants to connect with you online or find you and have a conversation, where should they go? I'm on Telegram. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can reach me there. Uh, so, so that's definitely good places to go, I'd say. Awesome. Uh, Cor, thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast today and talk about Concordium and kind of go into some depth and give us an overview of what's what's happening, what's going on, what you guys are working on. Uh, it's, it's very cool, very exciting. And I think the whole realm of digital identity and privacy, uh, the Web3 IDs, very, very fascinating stuff. So thank you for sharing today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Brandon. I really enjoyed this. This was uh, this was great fun. Of course, we'll do it again soon. Uh, take care. Uh, 